We began the series of panels with Syria, uh, and we're now going to conclude uh, with the Turkey, Iraq, uh, Iran uh, nexus. Uh, and we have here a, a number of fascinating um, uh, Turkish, uh, as well as regional and even global uh, issues involved here. Uh, not only Turkey's very new relationship uh, with the Kurds in northern Iraq, uh, something very different than we've seen uh, for many uh, decades, uh, new relationship with respect to oil and energy, not only in, in the KRG in the north of Iraq, but with uh, Iraq and, and the Gulf uh, as a whole. And I hate to, to say this, but in every silver lining in the Middle East is generally a, a, a cloud. Uh, with this has come some complications as well, with, first of all, um, the Baghdad government, uh, Maliki, not only with respect to the Kurdish issue, but with respect uh, to different positions between Iraq uh, and Turkey on uh, Syria. Uh, and then last but never least, uh, the very big elephant in, that's always in the room in discussions of the Middle East uh, in Washington in any event, um, Iran. Uh, so we're going to, this panel will generally address roughly uh, three issues. Um, Iraq's, uh, Turkey's new and rather positive relations as I've indicated with the Kurds and the K KRG, um, not only the implications of, for those Kurds, other Kurds in the region uh, and uh, Iraq, uh, the positive relations with respect to oil and energy, which hasn't really s received a lot of attention here, uh, where uh, Turkey sees itself uh, as an energy uh, hub, uh, and the new tensions with uh, Baghdad. We're also going to look at Iraq, in, with its complexity, uh, the new relations uh, with, uh, with Turkey, what lies uh, behind uh, some of that, and, and as I've indicated, uh, with uh, Iran, which comes down on the other side with respect not only to Syria, uh, but also its general aspirations for a greater role in the Middle East as a whole. We see that, of course, very clearly, not only in Syria with Hezbollah, uh, with Hamas, and some would say even rivalry uh, with Turkey. How is uh, Turkey going to handle these? This panel is going to help us, I hope, entangle these com uh, complexities and ex better explain Turkish policy therein. Now, we are going to start uh, with Henri Barkey. Uh, I don't need to introduce these people. You're probably familiar with them, and, and you have their bios. Uh, he is professor of international relations at Lehigh, um, has uh, written extensively uh, on Turkey, uh, on the Kurds, uh, and a number of other subjects. Uh, he will begin, and uh, he will be addressing uh, Turkey's relationships with the KRG uh, and the energy nexus as well. We're going to be, that Henri is going to be followed by Dr. Denise uh, Natali, who is currently Minerva uh, Professor at the National uh, Defense University, um, has done extensive work on the KRG, uh, written um, some very good books on this, and um, even more recently has expanded herself into the uh, energy field. She'll be dealing uh, with Turkey's relationship, uh, not only with the Kurds, but with, with uh, Baghdad, um, and a very delicate relationship there. And we will end uh, with um, Ali Reza Nader, uh, who is a uh, senior international policy analyst at RAND, uh, where he's written extensively on RAND, domestic politics um, in uh, Iran, uh, and he will help us uh, on the Iranian side. So without further ado, uh, we'll begin with Henri. Uh, thank you, Phoebe. Um, let me just make a slight change. Um, 
I'm not speaking first, I'm speaking last. No, no, no. Um, I, um, in terms of the shift, I'm going to talk more about Baghdad, uh, Ankara, and the KRG. And Denise will do most of the energy. I, we, we shifted kind of unbeknownst to Phoebe. We shifted our, um, um, what we were going to talk about just now. Um, anyway, I, um, what I would like to do is, first of all, look at the Ankara-Iraq relationship, which is actually becoming quite interesting. In uh, March 2011, uh, Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan went to Iraq. It was a fabulous trip. It was his second trip to Iraq, but it was also a trip that was, in many ways, uh, a groundbreaking trip because it was the first time any foreign leader addressed the Iraqi parliament. It was the first time any Sunni foreign leader went to a Shia city and a Shia shrine. It was also the first time a Turkish prime minister went to Erbil, to Kurdistan. And this came in the, uh, this was his second trip, as I said. His first trip to Iraq was a few years earlier, in 2008. And that's when a, a very major MOU was signed between the Turks and, um, uh, and, and the Iraqis, and in many ways was the beginning of the relationship. And the MOU had four aspects to it, according to the foreign minister, Mr. Davuto, that said um, it, was a, it was a understanding in terms of common security, a political dialogue, economic cooperation, and most importantly, a cultural harmony. Uh, so that was the basis on which the relationship would, uh, would develop. And the expectation was that in three to four years, Turkish-Iraqi trade would reach $25 billion. Fast forward to today. It doesn't look like uh, Mr. Maliki and Mr. Erdogan are in very good speaking terms uh, uh, at the moment. I think, in, in fact, they've been um, throwing a lot of mud at each other of late, accusing each other of being sectarian. Um, each accuses the other of uh, having a sectarian agenda, pushing a sectarian um, uh, uh, policies. And in many ways, you can argue that maybe both are right in this particular case. I mean, there is uh, something to be said about each other's accusations. And so the question is, what happened? What happened in between? And I would say one very big thing has, has happened and is happening, and that's obviously Syria. But it is also the fact that there is uh, the impact of Syria uh, on Iraq is actually quite, quite dire. And it is upsetting internal balances in Syria, uh, I'm sorry, in Iraq. And it is creating a different set of dynamics between the KRG and Turkey. And it is also a situation in which the, um, the Iraqi regime, I mean, I should say the Maliki regime in Iraq, feels itself under enormous amount of stress and threat. All right, so let me just uh, take those three aspects and, and look at them a little bit more deeply. I mean, Syria, I mean, I don't need, uh, uh, I don't need to go into great detail. I mean, but what's happening in Syria is um, very disturbing to, to the Maliki regime. In many ways, the, even though, I mean, just looking at yesterday, one can argue that uh, President Bashar al-Assad seems to have the upper hand. It doesn't look like he's going to go anywhere anytime soon. But remember, when this started two years ago and, and the Turks took it very quickly, uh, the position that Assad should go. I mean, they did try to change Assad's mind. They did send Davutoglu to talk to, to Assad, and Davutoglu spent six hours with Assad, which I think was very brave on Assad's part. But, um, but beyond that, um, uh, so the Turks shifted their position very quickly and said Assad has to go. And, it, and look, Assad is part, even though he's an Alawite and not exactly a Shia, is nonetheless seen as part of uh, this Shia axis that starts with the Hezbollah, goes through back, back, um, Damascus and Baghdad into Tehran. But most importantly, I think it's a perception that um, the, the Sunnis are about to win in, 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 um, in Syria, at least this was the, the perception at the, a year ago. The fact that the Sunnis would win in, in, in Syria would create enormous amount of trouble for the, for the Iraqi Shia uh, majority regime 
in, in Iraq. But it is very much the perception of Maliki's perception that this is very much a conflict between sects. It is very much a Sunni Shia sect. And he said this to a number of people, one of, you know, who repeated, one of whom repeated to me directly in, in the exact words that he said that, you know, that he sees um, the, uh, the Sunnis winning in Damascus and, and the Sunni powers from Turkey to then the new Syria and the Saudis and everybody else ganging up on, on, on him and in Baghdad. Whether or not this is true, it doesn't matter, but this is clearly his perception. But it is also true that the crisis in Syria has given uh, a certain amount of oomph and, uh, to the uh, Sunnis in, in, back, in, in Iraq itself. So that we've, we have seen an uh, uptick, a very significant uptick in violence between um, uh, in Iraq. And you can imagine that given the, the fact that the border between Syria and Iraq for all intents and purposes does not exist anymore, a Sunni victory in Syria is going to make it much easier for the Sunnis in Iraq to use Syria kind of as their, um, as their uh, uh, back, backyard, if you want, and use it to, to engage in activities uh, against, uh, against Maliki. From that perspective, I think Maliki does have a point. I mean, so the, he, it is, he sees it in that way. And, and the, the Syrian conflict is destabilizing, uh, very much is destabilizing um, uh, Iraq. Um, the second aspect uh, has to do with the KRG and the KRG's relationship with Turkey. Now, with Iraq uh, becoming more and more unstable, clearly uh, the KRG emerges once again as a place of, of refuge, the place where there is no violence, where the security situation is relatively stable. Um, and the relationship between Ankara and Erbil has become closer and closer because as, Mal as Erdogan has turned his back on Assad, is in this war of words with Maliki. He sees his, the relationship with the, with the Kurds in, um, in, in uh, Iraq as now the main axis, the mainstay. And in, for many respects, it makes, it makes actually a lot of sense for, for Erdogan to push for that because A, as we will hear from Denise, the KRG has uh, a lot of oil and gas and the Turks are very hungry for both. Um, they, they need both. Um, and in some ways, Erdogan's initiative towards the PKK in Turkey, which is a long-lasting um, uh, policy. I mean, this is not, yes, it's, we, we're seeing it now, but it has been, we have seen it in fits and starts earlier. I think ever since 2007, when, when the AKP won its victory in the polls against the military, um, uh, you, you, the military has been excluded from, from foreign policy making and certainly from foreign policy national security decision making. So you have now, the, the, the AKP has been able to employ, a, a, ha, have much more freedom in terms of its policies towards the, the, the KRG and they have quickly bonded. Of course, that the bonds between the KRG and Turkey also have come, were being sown by Turkish and Kurdish businessmen, and today the KRG is completely, if you go there, you will see it, is, it is almost like a little uh, Turkey in the sense that almost every single Turkish company is there, ev in every single Turkish bank is there. Um, uh, the, the number of, uh, the amount of trade between the two is enormous. In fact, most of the trade between Turkey and Iraq is accounted by the KRG. So that relationship, which was built, by the way, at the instigation of the KRG leadership well before the Turks even thought about the um, this, uh, this relationship has now blossomed, has become very, very important economically for Turkey. And add to that the, the oil and gas, so suddenly the KRG becomes far more important. And also, when, from, the, from an Ankara, Ankara's perspective, the KRG is the stable and is the re responsible partner. And ironically here, one has to say that, uh, you know, we, the United States government spent a lot, a long time, a lot of time, a lot of energy uh, 
trying to convince the Turks to have a relationship with the KRG. Now <laughs> the United States government finds itself on the other side and saying, you're going too far, you're going too, you're going too fast, too far with the, with the Kurds. You need to think about Baghdad because they see, the United States, like Maliki, sees the evolving relationship between the KRG and Ankara as potentially destabilizing to the unity of, of Iraq. But the unity of Iraq is precisely in danger, not because of, um, KRG's action as much as, as I would say, by both the Sunni Shia tensions in, in, in Iraq, Maliki's bad management of these tensions, and of course the Syrian, um, the, the Syrian, um, uh, the crisis that has given this uh, much more, much more room. Let me just say, uh, I'm not going to, I'm afraid of uh, Phoebe who gave me exactly 15 minutes. Uh, um, so let me say a few more things. I mean, for, the, for, for Ankara, the KRG relationship now is far more important, ironically, than the Baghdad relationship. Because it's not just the economics that I talked about, and it's not the oil and gas that Denise will be talking about. It is also the fact that today, in the peace process in Turkey, the KRG has a very important role to play, and has always played that very important role. The KRG is... Uh, has influence on the PKK. After all, the PKK is stationed in, uh, in KRG territory. But for both the PUK and the KDP have always been a channel of communication between Ankara and, and, and the PKK. Although today Ankara doesn't need a channel, but it is it, whatever solution arises at the very end, you can be sure that the KRG will play a positive role in that solution. So for, for Turkey, the opening to the KRG is, is important in terms of the final step, but also the opening to the KRG, the building of the relationship between the KRG and, and, and Turkey, the, the, all those businessmen that have gone on both sides of the border, Turks, Turkish Kurds as well as Turkish Turkish businessmen, right, have created essentially the, the initial steps, if you want, that enabled the, the opening to, towards Turkish Kurds. Now, that opening is still in the works. You heard from Eliza. You know the, that the um, you know it's not over yet until uh, until the final thing is signed and everything is on Kidori. This is going to take a long time, but because it's going to still take a long time, the role of the KRG is very important. So the KRG emerges as as um, as an important factor from that perspective, and it's very interesting that when the PKK announced that it would withdraw its fighters from Turkey and bring them to Kandil. The person who objected to it immediately was none other than Prime Minister Maliki. Right? Not because he's worried about 2,000 or 3,000 more fighters in, 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 in northern Iraq, but it is essentially that his perception that I think he fears that the resolution be in, in, a resolution of the Kurdish problem in Turkey will be essentially the elimination, if you want, of the Achilles heel of Turkey and, and the beginning of this hegemonic Turkey that some of the, some of the countries in the region fear, and especially uh, Iraq fears, that Turkey that has resolved this Kurdish problem will have so much more influence and also influence in Iraq where, there's the, where the KRG is there. So there is, there is part, part of that problem. Now, um, there are, of course, other issues that have separated Turkey and Iraq for a long time, and those have not gone away, and we should not also uh, forget about it. One is water. Right? The water is a problem. It's going to become a bigger problem. It has already the, the lack, the, the damming of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers have done enormous damage in the south in, uh, in, in Iraq, but it is also Iraqi mismanagement of water resources. It is also the drought of the last few years that has taken a toll. But so you realize that if you are Iraq and you're downstream, you're, only, you're looking essentially at a water future that is only going to get worse uh, by the year, which has long-term implications in terms of agriculture. We, we've already seen hundreds of thousands of people um, uh, leaving um, the countryside to go into the cities. And by the way, it is also one of the most important factors in the Syrian rebellion, that people who are part of the rebellion is also... Uh, you can see the, the signs of the water problem in the Syrian rebellion, but that's not that's not my uh, my topic. So let me just end before Phoebe stops me. Um, so the relationship between Baghdad and, and Ankara 
despite American uh, wishes to the contrary, I think it's going to get worse. And as the Syrian crisis gets worse, and here is a big danger, that we're talking about a much wider um, eth uh, sectarian conflict in the region in which Turkey and Maliki are en going to end up on, on the wrong side. This is not obviously a foregone conclusion, but all the signs today, because of the way Syria is developing, are there. But it has one very important consequence. And that is what's going to happen to the KRG. Somebody was asked, uh, somebody asked Elisa the question earlier about what will the KRG become independent. I don't think the KRG will become independent. I think what will probably happen is Iraq is going to leave the KRG. Or that, and, and here the critical thing will be what role that the Turkomans who live in Kirkuk will play. The Turkomans in Kirkuk have always been the, Tur the Turkey's main um, card in Iraq. But that card now has been replaced, A, by the Kurds, but the Turkomans themselves are now facing a very dire choice because as the KRG, uh, as the Erbil Ankara relationship improves, they no longer, A, have an ally in Ankara who's going to say, you know, the Kurds are bad. On the contrary, they have the opposite. But also, they're going to start seeing that they can make a deal with the KRG because they don't want to stay in Iraq. And that will change the dynamics with, with, within Iraq. And I'll leave, you, I'll leave, you, leave it here. Thank you very much um, for the Middle East Institute for this invitation. I'd like to pick up where Henri left off, and one of the questions when we all talk about here is this KRG relationship with Turkey. Um, we all know, as Phoebe and Henri discussed, um, there's this budding economic relationship. Uh, we know about the energy sector. And my question is, how far is this really can, can this really go, this relationship? And what I want to look at today is um, how Turkey and the KRG are going to maneuver what I see are numerous obstacles um, in the many cards uh, that Iraq still has to play. Uh, there's not only uncertain political turmoil in Iraq, there's Iran, there's Turkey's own domestic instability, including, as we, we learned before, this unresolved Kurdish problem, and of course Syria. So when we're looking at the KRG-Turkish relationship, I want to, uh, again, weave through some of these continuities and challenges. Uh, who has leverage? What should we expect? What is this relationship actually going to look like? We talk about interdependence, but in fact, we may see a greater Kurdish dependence on Turkey, and certainly not a state that has been threatened for the last uh, seven years and hasn't materialized. Nonetheless, what are the implications? And we will obviously need to look at not only Baghdad's role, but some of the Sunni Arab communities in Iraq as they play, as Turkey's playing out this relationship between the Kurds, uh, Baghdad, and again, some of the regions. So we, we know about the relationship, Henri has laid it out. This economic relationship, though, this dependency, it started well before 2003. And in the 1990s, when we were all there, the oil for food smuggling operation gave and underlined the importance of Turkey to the KRG. When there was a double embargo on the north, Turkey's, that border that Turkey left open represented 85% of the Kurds' revenues. And that just about matches what the KRG, uh, what the role is of that border today. So there was a, there was a lot of money coming in at the time. Um, and a lot of that money went to, of course, the, the KDP and Masoud Barzani, who controls that area. Similar patterns are occurring today. Um, secondly, um, you have post-2003, uh, how that has changed, again, is now that the scale is so much larger. Uh, the scale is so much larger. It's not just uh, smuggling oil. We're talking about reconstruction. And as Henri said, uh, we have about $10 billion of investment in Iraq with over 60% in the Kurdistan region alone. Now, but there's also, again, the political and security issues. This relationship started in the 90s as well, uh, not only when the PKK left Syria and established Kandil as its base, but there has been a cross-border security agreement between Turkey and the Kurds even before the tensions reemerged. And that remains important as they need to check the PKK. But, and, and what has changed, or how this has emerged in a different form, it's also becoming, let's say, feeding on the anti-Baghdad, anti-Maliki relationship, so that uh, Erdogan and Barzani's personal relationship is growing, as Henri said, either at the expense of Erdogan and Maliki, or uh, Maliki and Erdogan's 
tensions or benefiting Barzani. Whatever it is, this has also evolved as that relationship has deteriorated. And there's been some effort on Erdogan's part, perhaps realizing that it, it, it couldn't happen, but to create some sort of shared Sunni Muslim alliance in Iraq, whether that be between the Sunni Arabs and the Kurds and Erdogan, either through energy sector interests or, again, in an anti-Maliki alliance, alliance. And that has not materialized although there has been important new relationships between the Kurds and the Sunni Arabs in the Mosul area regarding energy exchanges. Um, but nonetheless, um, what, how, still, you know, we talk about the Kurds now. I was, in, I was in the north about three weeks ago, and there certainly is the pipeline, and one part of the region, one part, seriously believes that their way out is this pipeline through Turkey, and that will be the Kurds' saving grace to circumvent Baghdad and get their oil revenues and get an independent revenue source, which then could lead to some form of independence. Not everyone is speaking this way, by the way, but there's a, the significant part. And I want to, to, to look at where is the source, where is the real leverage here, and why I don't think, one, that this will lead to any type of independent state in the first place, um, is um, because of the fact that this type of, Turkey also has a lot of interests in the south, and there still is a zero-sum mentality, so that you have still in Iraq, 85% of Iraq's uh, exports are through the southern ports, and Turkey still does, the Turkish state company still does have four fields in the south. Um, TPAO and the Kurdistan region at this time, their exports represent on a good day 6% of Iraqi's exports on a good day. So, you know, how will Turkey maximize the rest of its investments? And yes, Turkey does have important investments in the north, but there also are hundreds of Turkish companies in Basra, the largest, actually, investor in Basra. Just recently, uh, Turkey signed this iron and steel plant worth $7 million. Uh, a project, and it goes on and on. So we have to ask the extent to which Turkey would be willing to lose Basra for Erbil. I don't have the question, but there is still, we can't forget that the larger markets are still Baghdad. And would Turkey jeopardize these investments? Secondly, we have to look at the realities of payment and money, because this is about money. And 95% of the Kurds' revenue still comes from Baghdad. So that when we talk about the Kurdistan region as Turkey's largest trade partner, and I like to look at it more as an import market because there really isn't much being traded out, but there's a lot of money being bought. This money is really being paid for by Baghdad because if the Kurds didn't have Baghdad's money, then they couldn't purchase Turkey's goods. One of my uh, young professional in, in, in northern Iraq, in Erbil, told me a few weeks ago, our money comes from Baghdad and it goes right to Turkey. Um, and essentially, we have to ask, would it be in Turkey's interest, unless there's another financial replacement, to lose the payment mechanism that's actually giving Turkey um, its revenues? So how would Turkey continue to be paid if the KRG loses its funding source? That would be another question. And, and there's this issue of the backfiring of sectarian politics. Henri's right. It's uh, Maliki, we clearly know, has been uh, engaging in sectarian politics, and so has Erdogan. So the idea of trying to push the sectarian agenda in Iraq, trying to create some kind of Kurdish-Sunni Arab alliance, is not going to pan out that could have, let's say, furthered Kurdish energy interests or, or Turkey's energy interests, because much of the Kurdish energy deposits are in the disputed territories, a good and important significant part of this, which is, by the way, largely Sunni Arab territories as well. So um, we have to look at how Maliki is going to play this out. Will he let the disputed territories become a Kurd Sunni Arab issue? Not right now, but nonetheless, there is, again, the issue of the disputed territories, and that brings in relationships not between the Kurds in Baghdad, but between the Kurds and the Sunni Arabs. And we talked about, uh, again, Henri spoke about the spillover in Syria of how, not only for Maliki is this important, that the Sunni Arab, uh, excuse me, this, yes, the Sunni Arab resurgence in Syria could spill over, and it's making Maliki nervous. It's also making the Kurdish elite nervous, because the last thing the Kurdish elite want to see, even after the Hawija, and I was there during the Hawija riots, 
when the Sunni Arab community came over and thanked Barzani because he let them use their, their hospitals, and we were at a conference, and there was these Sunni Arabs from Anbar thanking the, the Kurds. The Kurds say they have to, they cannot lose their alliance with the Shias. Why? Because many of these Sunni Arabs were the same Baathists that some of the older generation are still, in, in 30-ish generation, are still very concerned about. And they're in Mosul, and they're in Kirkuk, and the, some of the Kurdish elite, or many of the Kurdish elite, said we still cannot have a strong Sunni Arab province. They're more concerned if that Sunni Arab Syrian state emerges to uh, fortify the Sunni Arab community. So th there is a, a concern by the Kurds as well that they can't, you know, they need to balance this. They're in a pretty good position because they can balance the Sunnis, but this is why they did say we have to remain neutral. Because so. The idea or the hope, or if there was a smidgen of a hope, that Turkey would have a, a strong alliance between the Kurds and the Sunni Arabs, there still is. We can't forget that the Kurds need to play off the Sunni Arabs, too, because they need the Shias. And, and, and therefore, you know, you still need uh, some kind of alliance in some form or with uh, Maliki. Now, uh, Syria, Henri's made some very good points. And again, my question would be, what type of regime will emerge um, and what, how will this affect the KRG Sunni Arab relationships? Because again, when we're talking about exporting out Kurdish petrol or gas, we have to talk about the disputed territories. And some of these disputed territories that, that were considered before essentially Kurdish, like Cham Chamal, pretty much everybody knows this is Kurdish, even if it's a, ter a territory. When you start talking about exporting the gas, as opposed to using it for domestic use, now the, the, the discourse is, but this is not Kurdish because it's going to be exported. So the idea of what is Kurdish and what is not is actually or could be changing when you start getting into what are you going to use the hydrocarbons for. And this, again, um, the idea of just getting this, ex this, this gas and oil out of the disputed territories will now involve the Sunni Arab community as well and deals with them. Finally, there may be Erdogan particularly may have uh, be checked, this relationship, by the very nature of Kurdish nationalism. And for that, I say misreading Kurdish nationalism, um, not only in Iraq, but across the borders. Yes, uh, the KRG is important in negotiating and leveraging the PKK. Like I said, they've done it since the 90s. Um, but there's only so far that Barzani can go with the PKK. He won't and he cannot give the PKK, but there's also very limited influence of the PYD, whether we want to call them PKK, in Syria. Um, and, and, and again, this is why Turkey has been reaching out. Um, but, but within the KRG, and this was one of the takeaways when I was there a few weeks ago, and this is not going to affect right now decision making at the elite level, but it is affecting popular sentiments on the ground. And when Henri said, it's like a little turkey, it's just like a little turkey in the north. Um, but for the people, this is what I hear, we're a banana republic of Turkey. Um, this is going too far. There are restaurants that are not in the Kurdish language. They're all in the Turkish language. So you're hearing this, and we, we, know, we, we chuckled about it, but these were serious people. These were your average, they're, they're you know, smart, educated people. And it's just feeding into the growing opposition on the ground. I don't see a revolt right now. Um, Barzani's got a lot of power. But there has to be, again, a, a better reading of the sentiments on the ground in the Kurdistan region with what the elites want to export their energy. And there's still this very uh, sen the, the sentiments of Kurdish nationalism that they're seeing that they're going too far. And I'll tell you, the more you move out of Duhuk, and once you start going into Sleimania, then you're getting a whole different discourse altogether, which is Barzani's gambling with Kurdistan. Are you kidding? Our future is with Iraq. We know what Turkey's up to, and it goes on and on and on. So we have to be careful about, um, with, and that gets to my final point, is what's happening within the KRG. How far, this is not just about how far Turkey will allow the Kurds to go. This is how far the Kurds will allow themselves to go, given what's happening on the ground. Um, one, does the KRG have the leverage to, uh, and like I get back to the money issue, um, to export autonomously and not cut a deal with Baghdad would could so antagonize the central government that they can just cut off. I don't see Baghdad going to north. They have no control. The Kurds can essentially build a pipeline, and I don't see what the Iraqis could do. 
but they could cut off their funding source. So unless the Kurds, and they're, they're running at right now $13 billion a year on their revenue source, with about 76% going to public sector salaries. What's happened over the last couple of years is you're developing not only a rentier quasi-state, but almost like a Gulf state, which is the, the level of spending on public services is so high there's now strikes about the KRG subsidizing gas. Electricity is fully subsidized. As the KRG is taking control of the, of the territories, the, the, the disputed territories, that means they've added another million people to their payroll. So you have a fixed budget, and it's not the budget of the Gulf states. You've got about four to five million people, and the expectations of what the KRG should do are so high um, and then there's the funding that's going out for the elections coming up. So my point is, does the KRG really have the autonomy to break away from Baghdad and lose this $13 billion unless it knows tomorrow that Turkey's going to pay it 20% consistently? Because Baghdad can play with the KRG with money. So when we hear threats about seceding and I'm going to, you know, Barzani's threatened for, for so many years, you have to ask really how viable is that? And I don't see it very viable. And Again, because um, of this landlocked energy state, and we can look more at this relationship between the KRG and Turkey as it evolves, and it will evolve, as I would look at it more as a Caspian-type relationship with Russia. As that is to say, these landlocked energy states in the Caspian um, had to develop multiple transit routes, and, and the most successful state was Azerbaijan because it developed multiple transit routes and because the portion, proportion of its uh, revenues were not 95% of oil. It was about 40 to 50 to 60%. But in the Kurdistan region, working solely with Turkey would mean one transit route, and 95% of its revenues would be based on that transit route. So instead of increased autonomy, you're actually gaining greater vulnerability and greater dependence. So you're shifting dependence from Baghdad to dependence on Turkey. So the idea actually, it seems counterintuitive, the Kurds developing a pipeline to Turkey, which I don't see happen without Turkey's authorization, would not threaten or create a state or, or, or a, a very, very independent one. It would be one that's more dependent on Turkey. And that would be good for Turkey in some ways, but it certainly wouldn't be, it would be undermining some of the very political aspirations that the Kurds are seeking. And there you have the the, the tensions going on inside the Kurdistan region right now between tr some groups saying he's gambling Barzani with the future of the Kurdistan and our autonomy with those saying we need our economic interests and to export oil. And these types of issues are playing out right now in the region. Um, and again, finally, wanna, I want to note a couple of minutes. You do have this growing internal fragmentation and opposition to Barzani. Um, as I said, how much Turkish influence and Barzani, because of his precarity, he, he will remain in, in control for as, as long as he can. Um, but nonetheless, um, gaining and maintaining domestic support and regime legitimacy now is paying off people and it's maintaining the social welfare services. So there's a very important financial component of getting the energy resources out through Turkey because this is the only route but on the other hand, not losing the funding sources from Baghdad. And, and, and again, here I see any relationship, and I'll conclude, is we want to say that Baghdad will be out of the picture. But in fact, uh, Baghdad is a very important part of this picture, whether we like Maliki or not. And Maliki may not be here in five years or two years. There still will be somebody else. Um, and the Sunni Arab community is still very cemented to the territorial integrity of Iraq, and they do control or they claim to control these disputed territories. So this energy relationship will still be defined by politics. The Turkey-Kurdish relationship will thrive, but it will be one on greater KRG vulnerability to Turkey. I don't see Turkey being able to afford to lose Baghdad or Iraq in this KRG relationship as a means of everyone benefiting from this energy relationship. And Turkey's role is key, essential, because Turkey has such an enormous amount of leverage over the Kurds um, and not the other way around, that it could, once we got, you know, some of these more level-headed elites, uh, to broker a deal. And that's, that's how there would have to be a deal brokered. But with Baghdad is part of it. And, and I, and I want to end that there. Thank you. Thank you. Right, good afternoon. I just want to briefly talk about the Turkish-Iranian relationship and it's a very interesting time, I think, for both countries. Turkey has experienced protests 
and today is the Iranian presidential election. Uh, polls should be closed in Tehran and other cities right now, and uh, perhaps soon we'll learn uh, who the next president is unless uh, it goes into a runoff. Uh, and I think the Turkish-Iranian relationship is one of the more nuanced and uh, more interesting relationships in the Middle East. Uh, since 2002, uh, Turkey under the AKP tried to pursue a relationship of zero problems with its neighbors, and a component of that was very close relations uh, with uh, Iran. And for a while, anyhow, there was a lot of concern uh, in the West, particularly the United States, that uh, Turkey was looking too closely to Iran, that the two countries had formed a very strong partnership, uh, that Turkey was looking away from the West and seeking allies in the East, uh, Iran and Syria particularly. But as we've seen uh, during the recent events uh, in the Middle East, uh, there isn't very much to Turkish-Iranian uh, cooperation. There is significant economic cooperation, but the relationship between the two countries, I would argue, is one of competition. Uh, competition for regional influence, competition to be the leading country in the Middle East and the, even the Muslim world. And the relationship between the two countries, which has been historically one of rivalry, is today really marked by mistrust and uncertainty more than anything else, uh, much more so than uh, cooperation. So what are the reasons for this? The key reason is really uh, the Arab uprisings and Turkish policy towards Syria. Uh, the Iranian leadership views Turkish, uh, the Turkish position on Syria as being a fundamental challenge, not just to its regional interests, but to its very existence. Uh, there are other is uh, major issues at play, for example, uh, Turkey uh, hosting the early warning radar as part of the NATO system on its territory, uh, Iran's suspicions that Turkey is trying to offer itself as a model for the wider Middle East, and even uh, competition in places like Iraq, but including in Palestine. Uh, you know, there is a sense in Tehran that Turkey is trying to steal Iran's thunder on the Palestinian issue and in some ways uh, replace Iran as a force of resistance. On Syria, of course, uh, Syria and the Lebanese Shia group Hezbollah are Iran's key allies. Uh, Assad's downfall would mean the loss of Iran's only real Arab uh, state ally in the Middle East. And if Assad falls, uh, then uh, Iran would have a very difficult time in supplying Hezbollah, particularly if Israel uh, attacks Hezbollah or attacks Iran, and Israel and Iran are engaged in a military conflict. If Iran doesn't have a physical uh, access to Hezbollah, this could really impact its military strategy. And as we've seen uh, in recent weeks and months, Iran is trying to keep that corridor open between uh, itself and Hezbollah, and uh, right now it's succeeding to a large extent. That may change in the future. So uh, Turkey's, po Turkey's position on Hezbollah has been very disturbing uh, for the Iranian leadership. Uh, and uh, I remember even when uh, Turkey started pressuring Assad to step down, there are articles in Iranian media and revolutionary guards media specifically saying that Syria is much more important to Iran. We'll uh, pick and choose Syria and back Syria over Turkey any day. Uh, so I think uh, the Syrian conflict has uh, demonstrated that Turkish-Iranian cooperation is rather shallow and limited. On the issue of the Turkish model, it's been Tehran's perception anyhow that Turkey is trying to portray itself as a Muslim leader. Uh, we can talk about uh, the efficacy of the so-called Turkish model, however you want to describe it, uh, but Iranian officials haven't been uh, happy with Turkish behavior. Um, senior officials among the clergy in the Supreme Leader's office, among the Revolutionary Guards, have uh, described Turkish Islam as American Islam, as liberal Islam, really as a fabrication rather than what the Islamic Republic uh, li likes to pretend is the true Islam as practiced uh, by the Iranian regime. And I think there's also fear that 
uh, if there are future disturbances in Iran, especially among his Turkish uh, speaking uh, population in the Northwest, that they may look to Turkey uh, as inspiration. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, there were riots in Oromia, which is a major city, uh, Turkish speaking city in uh, Northwest Iran over water issues. And uh, there are pro-Turkish chants. Uh, so this is another fear the Iranian regime has that uh, Turkey could appeal uh, to, to his Turkish speaking uh, population especially if there are uh, major disturbances. Now, in 2009, when the green protests, uh, green movement protests broke out, uh, Turkey was the first country, or one of the first countries anyways, that congratulated uh, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. So it'll be interesting to see if there are future disturbances in Iran, how Turkey will behave. It could be very differently given uh, the changed geopolitical environment in the region. Uh, there is competition between Iran and Turkey in Iraq, uh, which was described uh, in terms of Turkish-Iraqi tensions. I won't go into great detail because the other panelists talked a lot about it. But essentially, Iran views uh, Shia Iraq as being a natural ally uh, and so would be keen to prevent uh, an expansion of Turkish influence in southern Iraq anyways. Iran does have a strong presence in northern Iraq, uh, the KRG, um, it has significant economic interest, not as uh, much as Turkey, uh, but Kurdish officials tend to be very familiar with Iran. A lot of them speak Farsi. Uh, they have homes in Iran. They were in exile in Iran. Uh, so that is another potential area of competition, but not as uh, serious as uh, the sectarian divisions between the Shias and Sunnis in Iraq with Iran and Turkey on uh, either side. On the Kurdish issue, you know, there used to be some convergence between Iran and Turkey on the Kurdish issue, especially after the U.S. invasion of Iraq. There are reports that uh, Turkey and Iran were both cooperating militarily and sharing information on uh, Kurdish rebels. And that seems to have diminished very much. Tur uh, Turkey has developed a uh, pretty uh, sophisticated relationship with the KRG. And now I think the major issue is a Turkey, uh, the Turkish suspicion uh, that Iran has been helping the PKK uh, as, a, as a way of uh, gaining leverage over Turkey, that Syria and Iran have been providing uh, support for the PKK. And this wouldn't be entirely surprising, uh, given that Iran did support the PKK against Turkey in the 1990s. Uh, Iran has um, declared a ceasefire uh, between uh, the Iranian affiliate of the PKK, Pejak, and so this is also viewed as a source of suspicion that the Iranians made a deal with Pejak and now are helping the PKK. Although again, uh, Turkey's uh, changing relationship with the PKK can actually diminish uh, Syrian and Iranian leverage over Turkey when it comes to uh, Turkey-Syria policy anyhow. In other areas, um, there's been some competition between Turkey and Iran in Central Asia and the Middle East, or I should say the Caucasus. Uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, both countries saw those regions as areas where they could expand their power. Um, you know, a lot of the Central Asian nations are Turkic speaking, Azerbaijan is Turkic speaking, uh, and Tajikistan is Persian speaking. But uh, really, each country's influence has been rather limited. Russia is still the major power. And so the Russian influence in those regions uh, has muted the sense of competition between Iran and Turkey. Uh, of course, Iran has very good relations with Armenia and has very poor and declining relations with Azerbaijan. So that could be a major, uh, significant issue in the future in Turkish-Iranian relations. It doesn't really look like it uh, for now. On the nuclear issue, I don't get the impression that Turkey is as terrified of a potential Iranian nuclear weapon as the Israelis or the Saudis, but there's concern there. Uh, I mean, nobody really wants a nuclear-armed Iran. Uh, in terms of uh, some U.S.-Turkish uh, tension on the Iranian nuclear issue, I would argue it's, uh, the tension is due to really issues of tactics and differences over tactics. Uh, rather than a strategy, because both countries want to provide uh, or prevent a nuclear-armed Iran. Uh, the Turks have been uh, prone to 
uh, supporting diplomacy. Turkey played a role uh, trying to mediate between Iran and the international community, which is ultimately a failure. Um, and uh, Turkey has actually complied with a number of sanctions against Iran. Uh, the two countries still have important economic relations, uh, but I wouldn't describe the United States as being completely unhappy over uh, Turkey's uh, economic role with Iran. I think, I think the U.S. government is realistic in terms of uh, what Turkey needs in the relationship as well. The source of, uh, sources of competition I just mentioned are somewhat tempered by the economic relationship between uh, Turkey and Iran. Uh, this econ economic relationship has grown tre tremendously in the past decade. In uh, the year 2000, it was about a billion dollars uh, bilateral trade, which is really uh, very insignificant. By 2009, it had grown to $10 billion. Uh, both countries wanted it to climb up to $30 billion by year, uh, the year 2015. But this is uh, going to be... Um, pretty unlikely given uh, sanctions faced by Iran and uh, tensions between Turkey and Iran. Energy has been the key driver. Uh, Iran supplies a lot of natural gas uh, to Turkey, uh, probably the second largest source uh, behind Russia. And also Iran uh, provides significant amount of uh, crude oil. Um, but both supplies have been in decline. Uh, it looks like Turkey is trying to wean itself off Iran, and if there are other uh, alternative sources, I don't think that economic relationship is uh, going, going to be very uh, productive for the Turks. Um, Iran tends to be a difficult partner. It has weak infrastructure. Uh, its pipelines break down or are sabotaged. Uh, Iran's economy is relatively closed. The Turks wanted a more open economy, uh, but the Iranians weren't letting, willing to let them. And sanctions uh, are making uh, co economic cooperation very difficult. Of course, there's still the gold trade between Iran and Turkey, which is important. Uh, and one of the few uh, openings Iran has into the global economy. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, there's a failure to achieve uh, diplomatic solution to the Iranian nuclear crisis, whether Turkey is going to feel a lot more pressure from the United States to cut that relationship off. And so uh, the Iranian-Turkish uh, economic relationship could actually be uh, very much uh, on the decline. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Turkish-Iranian ties are going to be strained uh, in the future uh, as long as uh, the Islamic Republic rules Iran and Turkey tries to maintain and stake a position for itself in the Middle East, cooperation is going to be very uh, limited. Depending on what happens in Syria, uh, that, the outcome of the Syrian civil war could really shape Iranian-Turkish uh, relations. If Bashar al-Assad falls and Iran loses influence, and if Tehran believes that uh, Ankara has been complicit in this, then relations could decline. But it'll be interesting to see as well uh, if uh, the Assad regime uh, survives and Iran maintains influence and the Turks reassess their policies in Syria, how that could affect uh, the Turkish-Iranian relationship. Uh, finally, although there's competition between the two countries, I don't think either side wants to see open conflict with the other. You know, these are two countries with a long history in the Middle East. Uh, they're both uh, ancient nation states. There's a certain amount of respect culturally on both sides. Uh, Iranians, uh, anyhow, tend to uh, see Turkey and describe Turkey with warmer feelings when you compare their rhetoric and policies toward their other competitors in the region, the Saudis and the Gulf Arabs, for example. Uh, so it's unlikely that we'll see an open clash uh, between the two countries, but the sense of rivalry and competition is not going to go away anytime soon. Thank you. Ancient nation states, there's a certain amount of respect culturally on both sides. Uh, Iranians, uh, anyhow, tend to uh, see Turkey and describe Turkey with warmer feelings when you compare their rhetoric and policies toward their other competitors in the region, the Saudis and the Gulf Arabs, for example. Uh, so it's unlikely that we'll see an open clash uh, between the two countries, but the sense of rivalry and competition is not going to go away anytime soon. Thank you. 
we're ready for questions, and um, I've been asked to uh, sort of throw out the first one. And I have a rather nebulous one, but it, to me, working on the Arab side of things is very important. Anri and, and uh, Ali Riza, to, to an extent, raised this sectarian um, issue. Uh, as some people re regard, uh, maybe the Turks do too, themselves as something of a model, an Islamic uh, democracy. Uh, but the certainly Baghdad, not only Maliki, but, but others, are now uh, looking less at a Turk Turkey which is neutral, uh, but which seems to be Sunni. To my regret, and uh, uh, really distress, um, these countries seem to be inclining much more to sectarianism. That's how you get elected. Uh, that's how you de develop a narrative. Um, those of us that work on Iraq see this um, in spades. And uh, the belief that Turkey is sort of interfering in Iraqi elections, I don't think is just a figment of Maliki's, Maliki's imagination, but be that as it may, um, Turkey is now seen as shifting to the Sunni um, protector, both uh, by Baghdad, possibly even the, the Kurds, and uh, that, that, that the Shia, that the Iranians are playing the Shia card uh, in many places, of course, is is widely uh, believed. I, I wonder if, if any of you, perhaps uh, uh, Henri, to start with, can address how Turkey itself looks at this, because it's perhaps not immune to sectarian spillover uh, domestically, and whether this is an issue that should be uh, sort of looked at. Uh, look, I, I, it's a very good question. I think the Turkish policy is an evolving one. I mean, if you remember, I started by saying that when Erdogan went to Iraq in 2011, the, the Turks were very proud that he went to see, uh, I think it was Kerbal, no, it was Kerbal, or it was, Na he went to Najaf. And that was really played out. I mean, this was the, uh, here's a leader, a, a Turkish Sunni leader who obviously doesn't care about these differences, but sectarian differences, he can appeal to, to everybody. Um, it, I think, also coincided at the time with a half-hearted attempt at uh, an opening towards the Alevis in Turkey. Um, and then things changed. And what changed? And I think it's in Syria. I think in Syria, the violence in Syria, I, I, to me, the turning point, and I'm, this is a speculation on my part, <coughs> is remember I said that Erdogan, Erdogan sent his intelligence office uh, chief, he sent uh, Davutoglu many times, but the Davutoglu, uh, the Assad discussion of six hours that I mentioned was just before the first Ramadan uh, after the revolts. And the Turks, I know, said to Assad, please, make sure that there is not an increase in violence during Ramadan. And Assad really upped the ante there. Assad really used far more force than, and the Turks were shocked. And whatever you say about Erdogan, this is genuinely somebody who is very, um, who believes in his religion, who is a pious man. And to him, to see in the month of Ramadan, this, the Syrian forces increasing the violence Targeting, targeting obviously Sunnis. That broke, if you want, the, uh, his relationship with Assad forever. There is not going to be, he's not gonna go back on this. And that's when the Turkish policy became more Sunni, if you want. And it has repercussions at home, there's no question. I mean, the, the, the Alevis in Turkey, and there are also Alawites in Turkey, Syrian Alawites because of um, Alexandretta being incorporated into Turkey. <coughs> they have reacted very strongly to the Turkish foreign policy with respect to Syria. And you see those tensions being expressed in, in, uh, in Alexandretta and, and in neighboring uh, provinces of, uh, in Turkey. So, but, but it, has, it has changed. It, wasn't, it did not start as such. I mean, Erdogan saw himself as a leader who could appeal to everybody, mm -hmm. and then it's Syria who changed him. 
neither country really wants to be viewed as pursuing sectarian politics. The Islamic Republic has traditionally tried to portray itself as uh, being the leader of the Shia and the Sunni world. And so uh, a purely sectarian agenda hurts both countries. Iran has limited influence among the Sunni Arabs, and even Turkey, which is a Sunni country, has limited influence among uh, Sunni Arabs as well. We can't overestimate the fact that uh, because Turkey is Sunni, uh, it has a model to offer uh, the region. But when we, when we look at the reality in the region, Iran's allies are Shia or Alawite, so it is forced to support those groups. Uh, on the surface, Iran says that it's not interested in sectarianism, and this is bad for it. And in a lot of ways, it is actually bad for the Islamic Republic. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't want sectarian divisions in Iraq. It would rather the Shia rule uh, Iraq uh, with a stable Iraq. Uh, but uh, given the geopolitics of the region, I think we face a position or a situation in which uh, sectarianism is one of the defining uh, drivers of regional dynamics. And I think, unfortunately, there's a tendency in the United States uh, because Iran is a Shia power and Syria is Alawite ruled uh, to see the Sunni states as being a bulwark against Iran. So I think for a while even Turkey was seen as uh, containing Iran along with the Arab states, but it's just not, it's not just uh, that simple. Uh, you know, promoting sectarianism in the region could have major drawbacks because a lot of these sectarian Sunni groups are also anti-American. They're not pro-Western. David, can I just make one point um, on the sectarian issue with the Kurds? Um, we really have to be careful because this is, when you're talking, when you're dealing with the Kurds, whether that be in <coughs> Syria, Iraq, or Turkey, we can't over-determine over sectarianism because that is not how the Kurds are identifying. This is a, still an ethnic national identity. And, it, and this is why Erdogan's uh, perhaps his hope to create some type of Sunni Muslim alliance in Iraq with Turkey and the Kurds didn't only could go so far. And it explains why we cannot and we do will not expect to see a strong Kurdish Sunni Arab alliance because the Kurds are actually frightened of a strong Sunni Arab region in Iraq. So sectarianism, yes, but not with the Kurds. Their still main issue is ethnic nationalism. Uh, it's been a very good panel. They've raised a number of good issues. Um, we're going to start with questions here. And then um, my name is Ilhan Kagri, and I'm from the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And I'm going to continue on this topic of sectarianism because since Hezbollah intervened in Syria rather successfully, the American Muslim population has been very polarized and uh, in very, very extreme ways that we found uh, disturbing. And so obviously this is, an, and it's a direct result of what's going on in Syria, and um, we haven't seen this kind of uh, polarization for a long time. Um, in addition, Mr. Bulent Aras, who spoke earlier today, spoke yesterday at the Wilson Center and said that the foreign ministry was also, uh, you know, worried about this sectarianism that's developing in that region, in the region, because of what's going on in Syria. So my question is, um, you know, you you've all uh, talked about what the problems could be. I, I'm interested in any solutions that you might see in terms of preventing this kind of sectarianism, because clearly. What started out in Syria was a move towards democratization. I, there was never any talk about, you know, Shias taking over or Sunnis taking over. It was a move for democracy. And how it got subverted into this is, I think, very disturbing. So I'd, I'd like to hear your views on that. Anybody want to? <laughs> Look, social events have a life of their own. I don't think there's something. We can't engineer solutions. I mean, they, they happen on their own, they develop on their own, uh, there are unintended <coughs> consequences. I mean, I think Assad's policies, I mean, the violence that Assad used and the, targeting, uh, the targeted violence that he used essentially inflamed the situation and created that. I, it's not, had he fallen very quickly, you're right, we wouldn't have seen this. And, uh, but, I, it, still, it still doesn't mean that there's going to be a major conflagration, a Sunni-Shia conflagration in the region. I mean, I think we should not exaggerate, but it's going to create long-term effects but, and lo violence at the local level. 
but I don't know what can stop it. So th there's nothing United States can do, that's for sure. Next one, next Hi, question. Jeff Steinberg. Continuing along the same theme, I hate to broaden the range of questions beyond the immediate topic, but it's kind of impossible to look at the sectarian issue without raising the question of the Saudi role. Um, the uh, Saudis are pretty much openly acknowledging financing some of the Sunni terrorism insurgency in the Anbar region and elsewhere inside Iraq, which is fueling that problem. Prince Bandar seems to be playing a major role in financing some of the most extreme Salafist networks inside Lebanon, and there's a dispute inside the royal family over that. So what's the Turkish relationship with Saudi? What's the Saudi role as the four of you see it in terms of this overall situation as a second leading driver along with the Iranians in pushing this Sunni Shia dimension which can get out of control despite the fact that I agree that Turkey's not really a, a major player interested in pushing that but the Saudis with an enormous amount of money and reach and backing from a few other GCC countries seem to be a driving factor. The Saudi-Iranian rivalry, I think, is uh, you know, profound importance, much more so than the Turkish-Iranian competition because it's driving a lot of what's going on in the region from Lebanon to Syria to Iraq, even in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. In some ways, the Saudi-Iranian uh, relationship is, is driving a lot of the tensions. I mean, what is, but what is the solution? I, I think as long as these two countries see themselves as being ideologically opposed, um, then we're gonna see these sort of conflicts in the Middle East. And when, when the Shah was in power, even the Saudis and Iranians uh, were competitors, but it was a very different competition. It wasn't as religiously driven. It wasn't as ideological. Uh, so, I, again, as long as Iran has that ruling system, uh, then we can, and Saudi Arabia has that ruling system, we, we can see some of these tensions. I think at the same time, though, Iran and Saudi Arabia don't want to come to blows. They rather do have others uh, do their fighting for them. That's why both countries are fighting each other in places like Lebanon and Syria and even Iraq, Iraq to some extent. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they want to uh, fight a war, but. Things can spin out of control. Tensions over the nuclear program, for example, incidents in the Persian Gulf. Uh, the region is in some ways uh, explosive, and I think that the sectarian uh, tensions are probably going to get much worse before they get better. Next, next question. My name is Michael Hoops from the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, concerning Iran, uh, Turkey, they've, they've clearly shown a willingness to decrease their energy dependence on Iran. Um, you know, they've, their most recent statistic is 20% decrease. Um, if, if they were able to decrease their dependency even more, um, what effect would that have on, on U.S. interests concerning Iran and their nuclear program? And the, the second question is, does, does Turkey have alternative markets if, if they were able to decrease further their um, dependence on Iran? So I'll answer uh, your first question. I'll defer to the other panelists on the second one in terms of uh, Turkey's alternatives. We, if we believe that sanctions are going to resolve the nuclear crisis, then Turkey cutting down on its trade relations with Iran could help. But if ultimately sanctions will not change the Iranian government's calculus, uh, then it doesn't really matter that much. I, I think actually sanctions have raised pressure on Tehran and have uh, brought the Iranians to the table. Uh, although I would argue that we're at a point where we should uh, push very strongly for diplomacy with Iran and not just rely on a policy of pure sanctions. So if uh, we wanna shape uh, Turkish behavior and the belief that uh, the most important aspect of Turkish-Iranian relations is the economic relationship in Turkey, and, Iran, and Turkey has to reduce that. Uh, I'm not sure that's gonna be that effective in the long term. Yes, Iran will become more isolated, uh, but you can make an argument uh, that in the absence of diplomacy, 
that uh, the Iranians are gonna dig in and make progress on the nuclear program. And no other country can really change that calculus, including Turkey. Uh, and, I mean, the Turks try to mediate. I think they're overestimating their influence and ability to reshape Iran's thinking. Because you know, Iran has been engaged in the Middle East for a very long time, and Turkey has just decided to uh, uh, refocus uh, toward the Middle East. And so, uh, you know, the Iranians are not going to take Turkey's lead on any issue. I want to just address the alternative markets. Before Iran, as you know, over 60 percent of Turkey's gas is imported from Russia. So this is the key market. Now, Turkey can work with and is developing the, the, the Shah Deniz with Azerbaijan. Now, depending on what happens in the East Med, and that's going to take a very long time, but there's a lot of contingencies if and ever Israeli gas can be exported through Turkey. Turkey's in a great position to develop alternative markets should the political issues be resolved. And this is why, of course, Turkey's very interested in Kurdish hydrocarbons. That would be the easiest because there's no long export route and it's, it's, it's right next door. One of the difficulties is, you know, we're telling, the United States is telling Turkey, you can't get your gas, we don't want you to get your gas from Russia, don't get it from Iran, and by the way, don't go to the KRG. Well, what is Turkey supposed to do? So there's, supposed, there's going to be at some point where one of, you know, we, where Turkey is 97 percent dependent on importing its energy, that at some point it's going to have to cut deals or make deals with some of the neighbors that we just don't happen to want Turkey to deal with. The gas is not going to come out of the air. So I do see um, there's going to have to be goings on with Iran. Um, until and it takes a very long time for gas uh, to be monetized and to get out, even if they were to start tomorrow in some of these new uh, regions. So uh, you'll probably see some type of obvious, you know, movement toward Azerbaijan. I think Nabucco is dead. Um, we'll see what happens with South Stream or Nabucco West. The rump is is remaining, and we'll see which pipeline uh, from the Caspian wins out. Is is, is w the way I would look at it. Mike? I agree with Denise. I don't know. My name is Mike Alvin. I'm an independent researcher. My question is for any and all of you. In 2010, 2011, when I was in Anbar province, the uh, provincial uh, council and the provincial uh, council members were quite interested in opening, uh, inviting uh, uh, Turks and visiting Turkey uh, with the objective of opening private schools along the Turkish model as they phrased it uh, in conversation. Private schools along the, Kurd uh, the Turkish model. Uh, I, I failed to find out what exactly that meant. Can you give me an idea of what they meant by those uh, private schools along the Turkish model? Thank you. Those Turkish schools are the schools set up by the Gulen movement. Uh, the Gulen movement has, I think, more than a thousand schools around the world. These are schools that uh, teach in English and in Turkish, and um, you have them in Texas, I think in Virginia, you have them just about everywhere you go in the world these days. And they tend to be very good schools. They tend to be schools that the elite tend to uh, send their kids to. Um, and I was in Istanbul a couple weeks ago, and um, there was a Turkish Olympiad, which went, Kids from all the different sc these schools came to Istanbul to to participate in kind of Turkish spelling bee uh, contests, and these are not all Turkish kids. I mean, there are there may be Iraqi, there may be Kurdish, there may be Texans, um, and so this this is actually a very s significant movement, and th those schools tend to be very good, and this is why people want those schools, especially in, in places like I would think in Ambar Province. Yeah, yeah, just to add, in the north. And many of the Sunni Arabs from Anbar are saying, we want to develop like the, the north, in the Kurdistan region. Many of this, there's the Ishik school for the girls, um, and um, my daughter used to be there and go. But there's also now they've created universities. And at Ishik schools, they teach Arabic, they teach Turkish, and they teach English. And they're far superior than the local uh, schools. And so they're, they're very popular, not even not even among the elite, for people who want to get their kids to learn English in another language. That's why they send them to Ishik as well. Very good. Has everybody exhausted his or her questions? I may be the most popular <laughs> uh, person here by ending a little early, but it, uh, it looks like
that's it. So can we thank a very, very good panel?